I don't mean to belittle anybody whose mind has been primarily on the mortgage. Even so, I can't imagine that any of you missed what happened on Good Friday, our time, and I'm not talking about our wonderful good which we had here, but rather about the mother of all bombs that was dropped on Afghanistan. Yes. Just in case you somehow bomb, which was dropped by our friends in the US Air Force, weighed about 10,000 kilograms, had an explosive militants who were hiding underground. I don't know whether the kill radius descended as they estimated that as many as 36 people had indeed been killed by the blast, presumably taken unawares as they slept in their underground beds. Now, um, I, I'm no fan of Islamic State and will be very happy to see the whole organisation wound up. Um, even so, even so I did find the whole dropping of the mother of all bombs to be deeply disturbing. It affected me so much, apparently the most deadly non-nuclear weapon uh, ever deployed, or whether it was the US president saying that he was proud of the bomb, or whether perhaps it was the fact that it happened on Good Friday, our time at least, I appreciate it happened on Thursday night, US time and that may have been deliberate. I mean, the bottom line for me is that Good Friday is a day in which we remember the way in which God confronts evil and is not by dropping bombs on action to what should be a very upbeat sort of service without baptism and it being Easter Day and all that sort of thing. But biblically speaking, I think the joys of Easter Day only make sense in the context of the pain that we celebrate new life and hope today in the shadow, so to speak, of the mother of all bombs. Mind you, I've got to add one more really exciting thing about the bomb, which if you pick this up, the cost of only 170,000 US dollars per bomb, uh, you can drop nearly 832,000 US dollars each, 59 of which you may remember were fired at Shariat Air Airport uh, in Syria last week. And when you consider the mother may have killed as many as 36 unwanted people, in addition to God knows how many plants and animals, that's almost like a 1,000 to 1 improvement in kill ratio. I mean, bam! I mean, of course, there's other economic factors you've got to take into account in this sort of thing, isn't there? Like, you know, how many disenchanted young men will now sign up to fight the empire on account of this bombing, and hence how much ISIS is saving itself in recruitment costs. Of course, you might need to factor in some economic value for the lives of those who have been killed, along with the costs of not providing dignity, food and shelter to the hungry, because we spent the money on bombs instead, all of which reminds us that we're not really dealing here with economic issues, are we? I mean, not... These are human issues, and all attempts to reduce the human to the purely economic or military or, or being political problems is itself a part of the problem. And a clear manifestation of what the Bible consistently refers to as evil. Even so, dealing with human beings in purely economic or military or mathematical terms is a clear form of evil. 
just as the mother of all bombs itself seems to me to be a very clear manifestation of human evil. Um, I've just finished reading a book about evil, believe it or not, Evil and the Justice of God by Tom Wright, where he speaks about the new... ...and say with some that this response to evil ha hasn't worked very well, uh, despite what at least appear to be the best efforts of our political leaders to rid the world of evil. The world today is, quite frankly, uh, a much scarier place than it was... 15 years ago, and indeed you don't have to travel to Iraq or Libya or Afghanistan or Syria to see that evil seems to be doing just fine. Now, I don't want to suggest either that evil is just something restricted to failed states and the battlefields either. On the contrary, I'm reminded of the wisdom of Alexander Solzhenitsyn when he returned to Mother Russia in 1994, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and after many years in exile, he went across the country greeting and showing respect to everybody, including a whole variety of former Soviet officials who had been part of the system that had persecuted and imprisoned him. And a lot of people said, you know, why are you being so respectful to these bad people? And to quote from his famous Gulag Archipelago, Solzhenitsyn says the dividing line between good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. Now, forgive me if that sounds like a predictably religious thing to say, that we must be aware of the evil in our own hearts and not just greater political evils. But the reality is, I mean, original sin, let's call it that, as it's referred to in the uh, in traditional Christian dogma, original sin is, I believe, as relevant to politics and society as the realities of social and political evil are to religion. Uh, one of my fa favourite political commentators, uh, Chris Hedges, uh, said, quote, We have nothing to fear from those who do or do not believe in God. We have much to fear from those who do not believe in sin. Um, without expanding on that too much, what Hedges suggests is that those who don't believe in sin, be they religious people or otherwise, they're the ones who end up supporting genocidal ideologies, believing that all is, that is required for a just and peaceful society to triumph is for the maladjusted or the undeveloped or the otherwise deficient members of the community to be exterminated. Now, as I said, I apologise if this isn't the all things bright and beautiful theme you're expecting for Easter Day, the mother of all Christian celebrations. But I do believe that to fully appreciate the wonder of the Easter miracle and all that it meant to the early church and all that it can mean to us, we need to see this against the backdrop of Good Friday, against the backdrop of the suffering and death of Jesus who dies as a representative of a suffering and oppressed people. What the first disciples discovered when they came to the empty tomb was not just that a great miracle had taken place, though indeed a great miracle had taken place, and not just that their beloved teacher, who had been cruelly taken away from them, had been returned to them, though indeed he had been. What they saw in the cross and resurrection of Jesus was the triumph of God over evil and over all forms of evil, personal, social, political, religious. The early church believed that in Christ God had defeated evil once and for all in all its many insidious manifestations and that God had done this without dropping a single bomb. God's way of dealing with evil is very different from the way that we deal with evil. We seem to think that we can destroy evil through inflicting violence on it. God's way of dealing with evil seems to run in exactly the opposite direction. God deals with evil by suffering it. I appreciate that intuitively this probably doesn't make a lot of sense to most of us and I struggle with it too. And maybe that's why we persist with the other approach, trying to stop evil by dropping bombs on it. 
I appreciate too that the cross of Jesus is unique seen in the scriptures as a one-off event that deals with sin metaphysically and historically in a way that we cannot do and aren't expected to do. Even so, the New Testament is quite explicit in urging all of us who follow Jesus to imitate him in the way he responded to violence by suffering it rather than just simply hitting back. I'm going to quote from um, the passage which uh, Graham referred to on Good Friday too from 1 Peter. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you should follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to one who judges justly. He leaves you as an example, Peter says, that you might follow in his footsteps. This is the Apostle Peter, a man who was in no way naive about the realities of human suffering and who would himself uh, suffer a violent death following in the footsteps of his master, quite literally in that regard. Uh, John Howard Yoder, in his famous uh, classic work, The Politics of Jesus, pointed out that uh, this passage of uh, exhortation from Peter is actually quite unique in the New Testament. It's the, actually the only place where we find the apostles pointing to the lifestyle of Jesus as something we should emulate. Surprisingly, there aren't any other examples like this. I mean, Jesus had 12 disciples, but that's not held up as, as some sort of, we all should have 12 disciples. You know, Jesus didn't get married, but that's never used as an example as to why we shouldn't get married. Uh, but at this point, we're told he left us an example that we might follow in his footsteps. And it was in the way he refused to hit back at violence, by suffering it, rather than just hitting back. Now, I'm not wanting to suggest that there aren't more things here that could be said in, in favour of the occasional use of force in the face of unjust aggression, and I'm not suggesting it on the basis of Peter's exhortation alone that we should therefore all become committed pacifists. Even so, I think there is an undeniable, it's undeniable that there is a great and unbridgeable gulf between the spirituality of the New Testament and any inclination we might have to take pride in the dropping of the mother of all bombs. Christ on the cross defeated evil. I mean, yes, that's hard to fathom. How exactly did it work? I don't know. Unfortunately, instead of leaving us a straightforward explanation that would help us logically make sense of us all, Jesus left us with a meal to remember it by. We'll celebrate that meal in a little way. It, even so, it's the insistent and persistent claim of the New Testament that evil was defeated in the cross of Christ some 2,000 years ago, and it's now only a matter of time before the kingdom of God comes in its fullness. The resurrection of Jesus gives us a glimpse of that future, of a world without corruption and pain and death where every tear will be wiped away. In the meantime, we wait and we try to follow him in the way of the cross. I'm told that for the first century people, it was not hard to understand that there was always a gap between when a general won his decisive victory and when you actually saw his standards appear in your own town. You know, the mopping up operation could be quite drawn out and pockets of resistance to the new leader's rule could persist for some time. Even so, in this age of instant gratification, I do find myself wondering how much longer this mopping up operation is going to take, as evil certainly gives the appearance of being alive and well in our world today. Indeed, I read yesterday that Russia claims to have a bomb four times bigger than the one that was dropped on Afghanistan 
and it's been labelled, yes, you guessed it, the father of all bombs. According to Russian Staff Deputy Chief General Alexander Ruchkin, he said in describing the bomb, all that is alive merely evaporates. We choose to serve a different God. We choose to take on evil in a different way. We choose to put our trust not in the mother or father of all bombs, but in the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who died and rose again to save us. Jesus, Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. And a happy Easter.